Ah, it's been a year of retail failure, company voluntary arrangements, stall closures, job cuts and the outright collapse of some of our best known names. There were dire warnings about the death of high streets and the demise of retailers who couldn't cope with online competition. And we covered it all here on Sky News. I think the high street is actually in a bit of a death spiral at the moment. So the, the most important thing is before we even worry about saving the person on the bottom of the swimming pool who has died, is let's st stop another couple falling in. Last year we had a big exceptional profit, this year we got an exceptional loss, and the 77% figure doesn't really reflect the underlying performance of the business. So what we're saying is, look, our profits were down about 22%, they're still down, yeah. but they were down by a lot less than the, the bottom line figure suggests. In more bad news for the high street and a sign of the deepening crisis in the restaurant sector, Prezzo will close 100 stores. Toys R Us is now facing the prospect of crashing into administration as soon as the end of this month. Bargain stores are not the only retailers facing challenging times. Pound World is just the latest illustration of a sector largely in turmoil. Customers are shopping less in stores and more uh, online. Um, I think an interesting number is that 30 of our leases were actually signed before the internet existed. We therefore need to take decisive action. Maplin also coming under significant pressure, but also blaming in the statement it has just issued in the last half an hour or so, uh, the devaluation of sterling after the Brexit vote. It's been a difficult year. These numbers are slightly ahead of expectations, but frankly, they demonstrate the need for urgent change in Marks and Spencer. House of Fraser's journey to the brink of collapse underlines the twin pressures of rising costs and the explosion of online shopping that have left numerous chains battling for survival. Well, to help me look back over the year in retail, I'm joined by the retail analysts Natalie Berg and Richard Hyman. Richard, let me start with you first. You've been at this for 35 years. When was the last time it was as tough as this? Uh, it's before my time. If it has indeed ever been as tough as this, I, I haven't seen anything like this before. Because of consumer confidence? It's, it's a whole combination of things. We've got no consumer confidence. The consumer economy is in much worse shape than people would have had us believe. We've got too much capacity, too many stores, stores are too big, too many websites, all chasing uh, a consumer that isn't really prepared to spend. And on top of that, we've got this thing called Brexit. On the one hand, you don't want to blame Brexit for everything. On the other hand, it's just as idiotic to assume that it hasn't had any part to play in retail problems and the consumer's lack of confidence. Well, Natalie, you look a lot at e-commerce in particular. We had a profits warning out earlier this week from ASOS, which suggests that these woes just aren't confined to traditional bricks and mortar retailers. That's right. I think online retail is an easy scapegoat, but what we're seeing now is that actually some of the more resilient retailers, even as you say, ASOS, um, and also looking at um, the high street, Primark's also been quite a very strong um, high street retailer that's now warning that actually the trading environment's very, very challenging. Um, but, you know, I don't buy into this idea that e-commerce is the death knell for the high street. I think, as Richard said, there's a number of factors, and I would actually add in this idea of experiential spending, and consumers increasingly are prioritizing spend on going out for a meal, going out for a drink, instead of buying more stuff. Is that just millennial customers, though, or is that across the age groups? It's cross-generational, particularly with millennials and younger consumers. Um, and this idea of having Instagrammable places is becoming a real trend in retail. Um, and I think that it also shows that retail needs to evolve to go beyond just offering product. It needs to provide a real experience that, that you can't get online. Richard, we had obviously a very big deal in the uh, property sector this year related to retail. Hammerson trying to merge with Into fell apart. Then there was an attempt to take Into private. Have you been taken aback by the speed at which some of these retail property assets have fallen in value? Uh, frankly, no. Uh, all this, the writing has been on the wall for many, many years. You can't keep building capacity. This goes for landlords and occupiers. You can't keep growing capacity with, with no reference to the demand side of the equation. And I think that the challenges that we're seeing facing the retail industry are just as big for landlords. Nothing is going to be the same anymore. So do you think there's any way out of this for the, for the retailers? Well, the, the way out of it uh, is that market forces, which will really kick in next year, are going to force the weaker players to leave the field. 
and uh, the, the gaps between the winners and the losers are, are going to be greater. So we're going to see uh, a, a really significant shakeout, much bigger than anything we've seen before. We've had a few uh, false dawns in shakeouts. The real one is going to happen next year, I think. So, Natalie, what did you make of these numbers from the ONS today? I mean, we're, we've already heard from Helen Dickinson a fair degree of scepticism from her. Well, it's been quite an apocalyptic year in retail, and these numbers obviously don't reflect that, um, which on one hand is, is great to have some positive news. Um, and clearly there are some shops out there that are defying the doom and gloom. If you look at um, Jules or Sea Salt, JD Sports, I think there are some retailers out there um, that are agile, that aren't burdened by an underperforming store estate, and also that don't try to be all things to all people. So these are retailers that really have a story and a really defined uh, customer. Uh, so I think with the ONS figures, it really just shows that spending is, great, is being pulled forward. We are holding out for Black Friday, we're holding out for the discounts, and I think the real question is, at what cost? I mean, Black Friday fell earlier this year. Do you think that made a difference at all? Um, well, it was a week before payday, which would have impacted those more value-orientated retailers. Um, but I think, you know, it's the same as pretty much for the past five years now. It's become a permanent fixture on the UK retail calendar. And I think consumers are savvy. They know to hold out for those discounts. And then come December, they don't want to pay full price. So, Richard, if you were running, you know, top shops over there, they've got 60% off at the moment. So, I mean, what would, what would you do in the next five days or four days to try and get people in? Well, frankly, um, it, it, the die is already cast. Um, the UK consumer hasn't got enough money to turn retail round in the five days that's left. That is the, the, the truth. It may be difficult to stomach, but it is. Um, I think that you've got to look at next year. You've got to look at how uh, you're going to defend your brand and its relationship with customers because, frankly, being on sale all the time is educating customers to delay spending. That's not a very smart thing to do when you're in retail. So one way or the other, retailers that are not able to trade more time at full price um, haven't really got much of a future in this All market. Right. Richard Hyman, Natalie Berg, more from you in a bit.